Bob's Breakfast. It's Graham Mack, and I'm a bit freaked out this morning. I checked my Twitter, and there's a message there. Well, to say it's cryptic is, is probably an understatement. It just says, make my day, punk. I'm the good one. And then there's a link to a picture of Clint Eastwood. Now, <laughs> it's Twitter. You get all kinds of things. And because it didn't make sense... I looked at the, the, the picture, you know, the Twitter picture? Uh, it looked familiar to me. So I clicked on the guy's profile and then enlarged the picture and then noticed it's a picture of me. Someone has set up a Twitter account as a fake me. So well, that's a bit freaky, isn't it? The really disappointing thing is, fake me's only got three followers. We're talking about the birth of the internet 25 years ago today and modern technology and what you miss about the old days. Pete, you remember those days? Before technology, you could go and hide when you're out on a shopping trip. You could hide. The missus would be shopping. You'd just sneak off and sort of go and stand outside Rumbelow's window and watch the football results <laughs> if they were on. Yeah. But now you get a text. <laughs> where are, where you? are you? Now she can go on that Find My iPhone and she can find out where you're standing. Track you. Exactly. Yeah. Where are you? Come here. I need you to be Gok Wan for five minutes and tell me whether I look good in there. <laughs> <laughs> What's your lost and found story? Something or someone you thought that was lost and you got them back? Kelly. A couple of years ago, I'd gone out for my birthday, came home, woke up in the morning and thought, oh, where's my shoes? Oh, another casualty of a night out. <laughs> I've lost my shoes. They were my favourite going out shoes. Oh, no, but that's what you do. You have to take them off at the end of a night, don't you? Oh, definitely. You've got to stand there in the kebab shop with your shoes <laughs> in, hand, in, hand, one, in one hand. And so where did you leave the them? Well, I had no idea. I couldn't remember, and I thought, oh, okay, then, they're gone. And then a couple of months later, I got a cab home and from town. I think I was on another night out, and I remember the cab driver saying to me, oh, did you lose your shoes? <laughs> and he was like, I've got them in the boot. No way, it was, it was the same, same, same cab. Wow. Hello, Graham. Hello, Graham. Life before we had all this modern technology, Mark. Things like mobile phones and FaceTime. Before then, mm. you had a normal phone in a house with a cord on it. Yeah. And the two things you used to, to do is, one, you'd have a money box put beside it where your parents just put the money in to pay the bill. Yeah. You used to use a cheek a little bit out of there. And the other thing was, we used to put a, a lock on it so you couldn't dial it. Yeah, so what you used to do is, you used to tap the little black bits on top and you used to, to dial a number out. That's right, you used to tap, tap numbers out. Yeah, so if you wanted to dial... You know, Penketh 5338, which was our number. You had to tap it five times, then then a pause, then three times, then a pause. Yeah, that's how you did it. Tap numbers that's out. Good, yeah, yeah. As, a, as, a, as a kid, it's like being a spy. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it did. <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. Talking about things that have been lost and found, I actually had something show up that I'd actually hidden. I met Julie in New Zealand. I was living there. And I met her, I'd already booked a holiday back to Britain because the job I was working on had finished. Julie's dad is a golfer. So he says to me, you're going over to Britain? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a golf club I'd really like if you could pick it up for me. That'd be brilliant. <laughs> so he said, it's a ping answer to putter. I know nothing about <laughs> golf, but I'll never... Anyway, so I found this golf shop in Warrington. So you want to impress the new, of course new I girlfriend's do. dad, Yeah, they talk you? about brownie yeah. points. So I'm thinking, if I can come back with this golf club... You're going to be like the dude. Of course. So I go into this golf shop I know nothing about, and the salesman says, I want a ping answer to, made of beryllium copper. Anyway, the bloke said, oh, we don't sell many of them. We haven't got one, actually, in stock. He said, tell you what we have got. We've just got, this is amazing. This is a Palm Springs putter. And I'm like, right. And then he said, no, this is like, this is twice the golf club that the ping thing is. This is, this is the one. This is the hot golf club. In fact, you're lucky I've still got one. And he really starts laying Good it on thing. Yeah. And he get, and then he, he starts, he, he's, 
offers me this amazing discount and i think well this sounds like a great deal so i buy it and think this will be even better i'll take him back an even better okay. one yeah so i get this so i'm on the phone to a from a phone box actually one night old school yeah and putting in the 20 p's pound New coins Zealand. yeah pound coins oh, yeah. yeah it was about 20 quid i think this phone call wow anyway so my dad's in the background he goes oh you put him on so i right. said so yeah he says how'd you go with that golf club i said i tell you what I've, I've really struck gold here i found a better one i found this palm springs no i don't like them no and you'd already bought it yeah so i didn't tell him i'd already bought it i said i found it i didn't oh. say i'd already bought it so what am I going to do now? I don't know. So I, I, I stayed with my parents. So I hid it in the loft. I thought, I don't know, I'd just forget about it. Stuck it in the loft. So a couple of years later, I've moved to New Zealand and I'm getting married to Julie. Yeah. So my parents fly out for the wedding. Actually, the first time, coincidentally, they'd met Julie and uh, her parents is, is when they flew out for the wedding. Yeah. They fly out for the wedding. My old man shows up at Julie's parents' house with this blinking golf club, he goes, hey, I heard you're a golfer, so I got you this golf club. And I thought, you lying git, you never, you found that in the loft. <laughs> the latest news now with Chris Hubbard. Tesco, they're going to be stopping sweets and chocolates being sold at checkouts at its smaller stores in an effort to help customers make healthier choices, they say. Uh, they're, they're saying it would Look, take if, away... if customers yeah. could make healthier choices, yeah. they could leave the chocolates at the checkout. <laughs> How tough life was before the internet, Danny? When I was 16, which was 25 years ago, yeah. I joined the British Gas as an apprentice. Yes. And to find any parts and part numbers, we had a microfish. Oh, I, the, 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 like, a, it looks like a, a TV monitor, but it was, With it was film. It's like glass. Yeah. What? Yeah, microfish. We used to use it to, when I was a pipe fitter in construction, we used to find parts that way as well. You, so it looks right, like a yeah. TV? It looks like it, but it's actually, looks like a TV. it's a Very projector, great. really. Yeah. A bit like the old BBC computer. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you yeah. type stuff in. No, you didn't type stuff in. You put no, a th there's no keyboard. You put a thing in it, which was... Like a bit, bit of plastic. It was a blue bit of plastic that had white marks on it. And, and it was microfilm. It, it had a, a magnifying glass. Yeah, and you turned it and scrolled along all these lists of parts and part numbers. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Wow. God, that must have taken ages. Well, no. You never found the right part anyway. <laughs> <No. And> <laughs> They were never in the right order. But they it was were all just thrown everywhere. It seemed so advanced, though, didn't it? This is microfilm. This is the future. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it was called the microfish. Yeah. Microfish. I don't know what the plural is. Whether they're microfi or microfishes. Well, they're extinct now, so it doesn't matter. Does that's it? right. Yeah, they've <laughs> gone with the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, Danny. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Ram. <laughs> It's the brand new Bob FM. We're all having to get used to saying the new name, even out in the office, you know, when salespeople that answer the phone. Sometimes, uh, just as a pure reflex action, they've answered the phone using the, the old name of this radio station. So now, if you do that, no, no matter where it is in the building, whether you're on the radio or not, there's a pound fine, and the pound goes into the charity box. So that, because we've just got to get it out of our system for, you know, for all this time, we've been the other name. And, uh, and now we are Bob FM. Good morning, Emma. I'm sure I've caught you saying Jack this morning, though. No, oh, stop it. I, I got, I, I only did it once and it was like half a word. For goodness <laughs> you sake. You did it, you said it, the it, whole word. No, I, it was a Jack, ah, and then I caught myself. It was, <laughs> it was not the whole word. That doesn't count. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> put a pound in that. Um, all right, I'll put a pound in the charity box. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, Emma. Bob's breakfast. Yeah, I feel like a fraud this morning. Well, I've, what's going on? I've cheated at Twitter. How do you cheat at Twitter? Well, what I've been doing since we became Bob FM, anyone that started following us on Twitter, I've started following them. On Bob. No, on my, you know, I got my Twitter. Yeah. And then there's Bob's Twitter. Oh, anyone that started following anyone, us on Bob, you've taken them? Yes, I've just followed them. Right. And one guy, I don't know, I just, I just go click, 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 all the ones that are following. It's about, yeah. I don't know, pr pr 30 or 40 a day, something like that. Yeah. Click, 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 click. I'm not even looking at who they are or anything about yeah. them. So this one guy, he, he tweets me back in English and says, thanks for the follow. Not sure why you're following me. Do you speak Arabic? Huh. And so I looked at all his previous tweets, and apart from that one, they're all in Arabic. Oh, brilliant. It's Arabic squiggles. Yeah. So, here's where I cheated. 
I went to, you know, that Google Translate? Yeah. I went there and I wrote, of course I speak Arabic. <laughs> Translated <laughs> it and then cut and pasted the Arabic squiggle into the thing. Did he reply? Yeah, but I don't know what he said. <laughs> Darren's on the phone, um, I've no idea what he's going on about, <laughs> but he really is passionate about, hang on, let me put him through. Yeah, Darren, so, uh, yeah, you were saying? Greeter at number 50, that is basically been acting as the, uh, secretary, because she's, uh, got all the computer and all the latest gadgets. Yeah, yeah. Um, she has actually had a response. Yeah. Uh, from somebody at the council, she came round and showed me on a... Oh, that's smartphone good news. Night, yeah, yeah uh, that is and, good uh, news, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they've actually, uh, they've actually talked about the double glazing and... Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I knew they would, because yeah. they had to in the end, didn't they? I mean, yeah. you know, because it was quite a campaign, really. Yeah, 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 but, uh, it's, it's taken, it's taken all this time. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, You know, I mean, it's been going for some five, yeah. six weeks now, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and the council have always, like, had, had no comment. Yeah, yeah. And the Welling Times, like, yeah, wouldn't give us a reason as to why they wouldn't run the story. Oh. Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. Uh, so it was all, uh... It was all like, sort of like up in the air for a while. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It weren't until it was taken and all the rubbish action. that they had yeah. collected was thrown out onto the main road. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, which was an eyesore, and that was picked up within 24 hours. So. Oh, was it? Okay, so things are moving along then since you got in touch with Bob. That's good to know. Oh, yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, that. Like, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I was hoping the same sort of response from well in time. So yeah, I yeah. sent a photographer and everything. Yeah, well, you I never thought, know with them, though, yeah. We have had some response. I mean, it's obviously, you know, obviously all the responses, excuse me, will go to greet her, um, you know, because she's the one doing all the emails and everything. Well, yeah, because that's, that's important. Word of mouth is one thing, but word of mouth is also important, isn't it? Well, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. but as, as, as for uh, them sending Serco round, like, yeah, to tidy up this street, like, yeah, um... I mean, that doesn't look like it's going to happen at no. all, so, uh... Yeah. Well, thank the goodness the... for Greta and her smartphone, Yes, eh? yes. Let's hear it for Greta, shall yeah. we? Yeah. Greta, thank you so much, yeah. Graham Mack and Chris Hubbard, how's your news? There's a new gadget uh, that might mean the end to washing up called the Baker Dish. Uh, makes kitchenware out of bread so that it can hold all sorts of food from soup to curry. And then all you do at the end, you don't have to wash up, which is fantastic. What's well, edible bowl? You can, they're looking at making bowls and plates of any sizes up to about 16 inches in diameter. Uh, and then these can be eaten at the end of a meal. As long as you know... Because I'm sure I went to a restaurant once and I, I had something that was, it was in, it was served in, I think it was like a, a sugar cane or something. It was like rice or something, but it was in like a thing. And I thought the thing was edible and I ate it and it wasn't. <laughs> really? Yeah. I didn't what know. Was it, made out of? it was, it was, it was like a, a tube of a plant, like, but yeah. like a hard, and I thought, this is really tough to chew through. <laughs> and it was like eating wood. And it wasn't edible. No. My mate in the Navy, his wife sent him a candle for Christmas, and he ate that. <laughs> he thought it was chocolate. What? It was a candle. It was a snowman, and he it was... <laughs> it was <laughs> well, he thought it was white chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> because sure. Martin Roberts, my mate from school, he's in the Navy, he's, I forget where he was, he's on a ship, and it's Christmas Day, he opens all this stuff, and he's like... <laughs> Oh, great, a chocolate snowman, brilliant. And then he finds the wick about halfway through, he's eating a candle. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for your ghost stories this morning. Julia? In the 1980s, um, there was an old wives' tale going around where we used to live as children, and my cousin and some of his friends, being quite brave, decided um, that they'd try and do what this old wives tale said and if you ran round a certain gravestone in a certain cemetery in Barnet um, something would happen at midnight so of course they did, off they went um, ran round this gravestone three times and on the stroke of midnight the beep on his digital watch went off and it absolutely scared the life out of <laughs> <laughs> so Where have you been banned from? Jim. This is a somewhat bizarre story. Um, years ago, I was a student in Winchester, and I was trying to get some clothes for a graduation ceremony. I went into uh, the Winchester branch of Freeman, Hardy and Willis to buy some shoes, and I made a comment that their shoes were rubbish. <laughs> and the store manager came up to me and he said, if you don't like our shoes, we don't want you in our shop. And I laughed at him. And he said, no, I'm being serious. 
and um, <laughs> he escorted me out of the shop. Wow. And um, I, I still thought he was joking. I went back the next week, went back in the shop, and uh, he just come up to me, and the only words he said to me was, I told you once. <laughs> <laughs> you were banned for life? You got banned from banned Freeman, life. Hardy and Willis. <laughs> that is yeah. tragic. Thanks yeah, for the story, Jim. Try anything on. <laughs> <laughs> it's breakfast on Bob. When you've messed up at work, Kelly. I now I now work in IT. Oh and yeah. So a long time ago, um, when I was a newbie, newbie. You know the you know the jokes that people play, you know play on the newbie. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's heart and pain. Yeah. Like, well, I was um, I was sitting at my desk and I was call, and then somebody kind of calls and then asks you know, and rings me up and says. Um, I would like some details on penetration testing. So I've kind of just looked, looked at my colleague and just thought, no, I'm not having it. So I'm not having it on with me. So I've kind of looked at my colleague and thought, no, no, it's not. And I was like, no, sorry, you're having me on. And I, I wouldn't have it. This person on the phone was like, no, honestly, I would really like some details on if you can offer penetration testing. So anyway, I've hung up on him and thought, no. So the customer pho you know, phoned back and spoke to one of my colleagues who then has obviously dealt with it in a more professional manner than what I did. It was only after now, years later, I now understand what pen testing is, and it is nothing rude. <laughs> it is actually a real IT term. So <laughs> as you can imagine, companies are hired to try and break through firewalls. And right. Mm. So that's what it is. I so, think it was something completely disgusting. Kelly, yeah, Kelly that, that just shows that you have a dirty mind. That's all it does. Well, that's probably <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for Bob's best. The best of everything, the category at the moment, Bob's best pub. Stop the show! Cosmic Colin is on the phone. Yeah, how you doing? Very good, Cosmic. What messages do you have for us today? Yeah, vote for the Golden Griffin. Wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Wait, back up, vote for what? The go Golden Griffin. The Golden Griffin. Phil Farm, Harfield, it's a pub. The Phil Golden Farm. Griffin, yeah. Yeah, and how often do you go there? Um, not very often now. Have you been there this morning, Cosmic? No, no, I don't have a drink this early. Oh, OK. OK, all right. I, I don't know if you were suggesting that, George. You know, you might have gone in for a soft drink or something. Yeah, I was thinking orange juice, lemonade. Yeah, they might do nice breakfast or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, pubs these days, they kind of... No, the food is rubbish there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmic, you're not helping. <laughs> when you've messed up at work, Marilyn... I was working as a technical advisor with a company and um, I had a phone call from a person who really wanted to find some copper alloys and so I put on a search for him and I couldn't find exactly what he wanted and so I was going to wish him success in what he was going to find because it was obviously important to his business and instead I heard myself say, I hope you have sex. <laughs> To which she replied, thank you, Pet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a psychologist might say this was Freudian. Well, because I have a large family, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Mac and Jules, and we're talking about nicknames this morning. You've got one, Pete. Silent West is my nickname. Silent West? Yeah. Well, I don't talk a lot when I play poker. Right, so did you give yourself <laughs> that nickname? Uh, a group of my friends and myself, yeah. <laughs> now, this is poker, so you play poker, do you? I used to, yeah. Right. So, did you win any money? Uh, no. No, I just play for five mil points. Si yeah, Silent West. W what about the West bit? Uh, that's my surname. Ah, ah I... Okay. And so, you wouldn't give anything away? There were no tells with you? That's uh, not verbally, no. Oh, I see. There were always twitches and stuff, were there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turns how uh, observant you are, doesn't it? Yeah, I always, you know, there used to be that painting, the dogs playing poker. Do you ever see that? Uh, no, yeah, I've seen images of it. Yeah, yeah. I always thought, what a stupid painting. There's no way dogs can play poker, because if they get a good hand, they'll wag their tail. <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. Let's get the news now with Chris Hubbard. Food banks are back in the news this morning. A food bank charity saying it's handed out nearly a million food parcels in the last year. You know, I've had thing. an idea. It, here's what here's what we could do, yeah. right? We get a cinema to show us a blockbuster movie. Stay with me on this. But this relates to food banks, absolutely. Right. Okay. We get a cinema to show a blockbuster movie, 
and we say to the cinema, we'll give you all the publicity and, and mention you and, and we'll fill a cinema, and we say to Bob FM listeners, you can go to this cinema on this night and watch this exclusive showing of this blockbuster film as long as you bring a can of food. And we have the food bank there on the night to collect all the cans of food. Well, that'd be good if you got a big auditorium. I've got a name for it, too. Go on. The Can Film Festival. Oh, my goodness. Everybody wins. <laughs> that is nice. good, though. Everybody yeah. wins. No, because, you know, who, everyone likes a night out of the pictures. Yes. It's, it's good. And a food bank would raise, like, say say uh, you had a big order, say it was like, say, 400 people. Could a food bank honestly get 400 cans of food in one night? We would get them 400 cans of food. Bang! Like yeah, that. absolutely. I, I reckon people would give more than just one can of Of course they would. Yeah. Of course they would. And we could be there to shake hands with everyone. We could even make a little video to show on the screen before the film starts of just the three of us. You've been about this quite, quite... Well, you know, these food banks, it comes up a time and time and time again, and you think, well, surely there's something we can do. We can use our powers for the forces of good and not for evil. <laughs> uh, if there is a cinema that could help us out, that has got, uh, you know, all, all we need... And just think of all the extra popcorn and Coca-Cola and stuff you'll sell, because norm- we could do it in the week, we could do it on, a, you know, a night when... There'd be hardly anyone in the auditorium anyway. It really would be no skin off your nose, and there would be a bit of a kickback, because, you know, you could the concessions, shall we say, would be uh, lucrative. So if you, if you can help, please get in touch. <laughs> Looking for your encounters with wildlife stories. What's yours, William? We've had a bird in the uh, kitchen. Have you? Before mm. now. It's yeah, scary, isn't it? Scary. Yeah. Was it a big bird? Um, it was. Oh, what was it? Yeah, it was a big black bird. All oh, right. It opened the French windows, and mm. luckily it went out. But what we couldn't understand was that was in the morning, and that must have been in the house all night. Oh. And um, we didn't hear it, or, you know, I, I don't quite know what happened there. But, uh, wife just came down in the morning and found it. Ah. Oh. And that was that. Goodness me. I remember my parents had a bird in the chimney. And they, they talked about how it was there. And they got a guy in and a guy came in and he fixed the chimney and he checked out the the gas fire. And there was actually, they found a leak in the pipe or something. But typical my mother, she went, that bird had a message. That bird had a message <laughs> that we needed to get the fire checked or we could have all been blown up. That bird came with a message. That's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Funny how people read things. <laughs> into things it isn't, is, it? isn't it? All right. Hey, thanks, mate. Okay, mate. Cheers. We're looking for your encounter with wildlife story. <laughs> Have you witnessed a random act of kindness, Jim? One of our senior managers, on his way to Starbucks every morning, buys two coffees. Um, and then when he gets into the office, the first person he sees gets one of his coffees. <laughs> oh, that's so nice! He does that every day. Every day, every day he's in there in our office in London. He does it. He goes to Starbucks. The first time it happened to me, he came in and said, "Do you like coffee?" And it was like, "Is this one of these questions like puppies?" <laughs> um, and it's like, "Well, yeah, yeah, I do." He says, "Oh, I have a coffee," and I'm like, "No, no, you have it." He says, "No, no," he says, "I always get two." I'm like. Oh, thanks very much. And then I got it, and it was mocker, and it was disgusting. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'd rather just get a cup of tea from the machine. Bob's Breakfast. Graham Mack and Jules and Chris Hubbard has your news. The latest must-haves in China. Dogs that look like pandas. Oh, Panda these dogs. are adorable. What are these? Are these a breed of dog, or do they 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 groom a dog to make it look like a panda? What no, they, they, they groom a dog to to look like a panda. Oh, I don't like this. No, I don't like. <laughs> I, I don't love like, it. Oh, when no. they do this, you see the dog there. And there's, have you seen? There's all sorts of ones where they shave them and colour them. And there's one that made them look like a ninja turtle. You ever see that one? <laughs> there's, a, there's like a poodle that turned into a ninja turtle. I was, I don't like this. Well, there, there's an animal store in uh, the the um, China's Sichuan province uh, saying that he's struggling to meet demand for these these animals. Um, he said, ten years ago, the natural instinct of a Chinese person was to eat a dog. Now we're like Westerners and want one as a companion. Oh, they're really coming ahead in leaps and bounds. They really are. So he 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 says he admits uh, to using a bit of trickery to make these dogs look like pandas. So he used a bit of grooming, colouring, and really just fluffs up their fur and, and kind of colours them. The The only problem is, 
uh, the will stay for the dog for only around six weeks. Yeah, it's a bit like highlights. It's expensive to maintain. Mm. 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 Your panda's roots need doing. <laughs> <laughs> when you've had an encounter with wildlife, what's your story, Ben? It has um, crickets and locusts in the house. How have you ended up with crickets and locusts in your house? Well, I used to keep um, bearded dragons, uh -huh. and I ordered three boxes of, of giant crickets and locusts. Live? And as live food and, and I remember I was away at the time with a girlfriend's and they got delivered while I was away and um, there was a hole in the box because they're basically I've got some sand as well oh, when no. I came home the boxes were empty no and for the next two weeks the house was full of black locusts <laughs> and crickets I was living with girls at the time and they were just so mad because they even found them, I remember, in their underwear drawer. Oh! You infested their house! Oh, that is <laughs> rank. <laughs> it's that very special time of year, a time of year when we're reminded that Jesus died for our sins. So remember, kids, if you don't sin, Jesus died for nothing. Bob's Breakfast. A couple of things in the news this week that I think we can have collide and when they collide i think bob fm can use our powers for the forces of good and not for evil the two things are food banks been in the news a lot lately they're saying they're more stressed than ever and more people than ever in the current economic climate are turning to food banks for help the second thing is the announcement of which films will be shown and which films are competing in the Cannes Film Festival in May. Here's where I think we can make them collide for the good of everyone. You see, I've got this idea. I mentioned it to Chris Hubbard in our news team the other day. If we could get a cinema to show a film, like a, a hot current film, and as far as admission to that particular showing of the film is concerned, if you bring a can of food and the local food bank collects that can of food, that's your admission. So you basically, you get to watch a hot film for free. The food bank gets to collect hundreds of cans of food in one night. And if we do it, between the 14th and the 25th of May, which is when the Cannes Film Festival, you can already see where I'm going with this, when the Cannes Film Festival is on in Cannes, we could have our own Cannes Film Festival. I think it's a great idea. You get to watch a great film for free and you get to help somebody. And the food banks get hundreds. I mean, you know, they do a great job of collecting. How else could they get hundreds? I mean, we're talking like three or four hundred cans of food in one night. Now, the beauty of this is, because it's over uh, quite a long period, the 14th to the 25th of May, and it's a festival, we could have more than one cinema involved in this. We could have cinemas all over Bob FM's now massive broadcasting footprint you know we used to only be available in hertfordshire when we were on fm only we're still on fm but you may have discovered that you can now hear bob fm on dab radio as well and the dab signal goes everywhere not only is it crystal clear it goes to so many places i mean there are now millions literally millions of people that can hear bob fm right now because of dab we're staying on FM, that's not going anywhere. But DAB is the future, and you can now hear us in all of the home counties. Uh, north of, well, Hearts, Beds, Bucks, I know Northampton, even parts of Berkshire, I think. Anyway, we're on this massive area. There's no reason why we can't have cinemas in all kinds of areas during that period, showing different films on different nights and collecting for different food banks, local food banks. This thing could be huge. The Cannes Film Festival with Bob FM. All I need is some cinemas to get involved. Do you know someone who runs a cinema? Do you work at a cinema? Can you have a word? Do you work for a food bank? 
and maybe you could put some leverage, a bit of pressure on them. Because they're going to get publicity for their cinema, they're going to get a full theatre on a night when perhaps the theatre wouldn't be full that night, so they're going to get a bit of a kickback from the concessions, let's face it, that's how they make a lot of their money, is from the, the Maltesers and the popcorn and the Coca-Cola and all the other stuff and the nachos and stuff. So they're going to get something out of it too. We can talk to people from the food bank, we can get some stories of some real people, we can build some awareness of what people are going through in these tough times. You get to see a great film for free and they get cans of food. Everybody wins on this. But it's not going to happen if I don't get at least one cinema involved. And it may be this is an annual event, and it may be that this year we only get one cinema involved, and next year two, year after three, who knows? But wouldn't it be great to kick it off with, like, loads of cinemas? The Cannes Film Festival. If you can help me out with this, because right now, it's just an idea. And ideas are fine. But it wasn't ideas that landed them on the moon. It was hard work and opportunity and trial and error and all kinds of things. All right, comparing it to the moon landing, all right, you know, maybe I'm going a bit far there. But I really do think this is a great idea, don't you? And all it would take is for some cinemas to get involved. But I don't have any contacts with cinemas. I'm not in, the, I'm not in that game. I don't know anything about it. I don't know how it works. If you can help me out, uh, send me a bob mail. You can do that at bobfm.co.uk or I'm Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M, Graham, at bobfm, B-O-B, dot co.uk. Graham at bobfm dot co.uk. We haven't got much time on this. We're already halfway through April. If you can help me out and get this off the ground, this could be just a fantastic thing. The Cannes Film Festival. Hopefully coming soon to Bob FM. <laughs> Graham Mack and Jules, Chris Hubbard has your news. Continuing to cause controversy, David Cameron and an article he wrote for the Church Times last week in which he wrote of his own faith, the Christian faith, and his desire to infuse politics with Christian ideals and values. Now, today, more than 50 writers, scientists, broadcasters, academics have all signed an open letter, which has been published in The Telegraph, um, concerned at the negative consequences of the Prime Minister's comments in a country where they say most people do not describe themselves as Christian. They say it could cause alienation and division. So he's trying to say that politics should have more Christian values. That's right, yeah, yeah. You know what he's doing, don't you? He's What's backpedaling. That? He's trying to appease Christians after the gay marriage thing came through. You reckon? Christians are against gay marriage. God hates gays. True Christians are not happy about the gay marriage thing. So he's doing this now to kind of backpedal and appease those Christians. Well, Christians. I mean, the Bible. Have you ever read the bit in the Bible about gays? I wish people wouldn't ask me this, because I'm not a big Bible reader, <laughs> to be perfectly <laughs> honest. It's really scary, because, you know, you, you get this, this impression that God loves everybody. God hates gays. It's in the Bible. This is what it says. It says, this is Leviticus 2013. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. This is what it is. Christians want to kill gays. They don't just like, dislike, they want to kill them. So, this is why David Cameron's backpedaling now, because the Christians who don't like the fact that he brought in the gay marriage thing, that's what this is all about. It's scary. Blimey. He wants politics to be infused with the... Have you seen... The Bible wants to stone people to death? There's some scary, really evil stuff in the Bible. He wants to be careful about what he says about how we should be bringing in more Christian values. Some of those Christian values, not very nice. Bob's Breakfast. It's Graham Mack and Chris Hubbard. How's your news? Bizarre story about what early Australian settlers actually ate. Uh, kangaroo brains, roast wombat and emu. Uh, so all these things that the British went over there and tried to adapt, uh, some of the things that were quite merrily enjoying themselves in the Australian wildlife uh, before the British went over there. But the thing is, the Aborigines had been, you know, eating bush tucker, mm. 
for you know thousands of years before yeah you know they you know they were eating witchetty grubs and uh, goannas which are a big lizard they just you know cook them up on the fire and you know it, it's strange how the 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 we're fascinated by what the early settlers ate when there are already people there living off the land oh, in completely. the first place and we're not yeah. we're not kind of interested in that or having a look at what they were eating because clearly they've done all right <laughs> they, they were doing really well. it's just when whenever you send the british somewhere they've always got to have their own adaptation of a recipe they've always got to try and make a mark haven't they with with something traditionally british uh, they, they were saying uh, stuffed wallaby was a substitute for scottish hair yeah, well, that's the thing. That's how Australia ended up with a rabbit problem, is we took the... We introduced the rabbits to make the Australian countryside look more like the British countryside. Really? Yeah, and they became such a, a, a nightmare. They yeah. had to build a rabbit-proof fence. There's a rabbit-proof fence that goes right down the middle of the continent. Wow. A rabbit-proof fence to try and stop them getting across... I think it was to try and stop them getting into Western Australia. I think it failed. It's still there, the rabbit-proof fence. Really? Yeah. Not having me on? No, it's thousands of, it's thousands of miles long. It's amazing. No, the, we, the, the British settlers, yeah. I mean, they did just so many bad things. And, you know, I used to be on the radio there, mm. and I used to cop it. <laughs> a bloke, <laughs> these years a bloke rang me up one night and he went, Yeah, what are you blinking poms doing on the radio? I break a pommy on the radio now. I mean, I think he'd had a drink. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, have you got a problem with that? Oh, you blinking pommies, you, you came over here and you, you ruined this country. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, you brought your blinking rabbits and your diseases and your rats and your gorse. And I said, hey, hang on a minute. My ancestors never left Britain. I've only been here a couple of years. <laughs> My ancestors never left Britain. I think you'll find it was your ancestors that ruined this country. <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. The Cannes Film Festival. All I need is a cinema to watch the film for free. All you do is bring a can of food. And then the local food bank collects the food on the night. They get, you know, between three and four hundred cans of food in one night. So all I need is a cinema. It's a great idea. We just need someone to, to a cinema and a, and a great film to put on it. Hold on a sec. You put them through. Hello, who's this? Hi, it's Gavin from the Garden City Cinema. Garden City Cinema? Fancy. Mm. We may have a little job for you, Gavin. Can you help us out? I think I can help you out. What can Wonderful. you do? I can give you a 360-seat cinema with a lovely film, nice Sunday evening for all the family. Tell us about the film, What then. film, yeah, what film can we see? Well, the film I think would be best is a film called The Love Punch. Uh. Oh, this has got Emma Thompson. I've seen the trailer for this, it, yeah. It has, in has indeed a list of beautiful stars. And Piers Brosnan as well. And, exactly, and who doesn't like a love story? Exactly. exactly. Yes. That'd be nice for a Sunday evening. Oh, this is exciting. This is starting to take shape. Thank you. Let's get down to business, though. You know, we have no budget and we don't pay for stuff. That's okay. Okay, <laughs> all right. That's what we like to hear. Okay, now, as far as it works on the night of the film, as long as people show up with a can of food, that it doesn't cost them anything either. It doesn't cost a penny, but obviously, the more cans they bring, the happier we'll be. Of course we will. All right. What night is the, is the theatre available? I've got a lovely day for you, Sunday, the 18th of May at 8pm, a nice Sunday evening film. Oh, perfect. So it's Sunday the 18th of May. All right. Gavin, thank you so much. That's not a problem at all. Look at that. It's a happening thing. The Cannes Film Festival coming soon with the Garden City Cinema and Bob FM. Bob. Graham Mack and Jules. I'm not sure I should even have Chris on the record because I've just made such a big mistake with Chris. <laughs> I can't believe that you've been doing this for, what, two weeks, three Com weeks? Completely. Maybe even longer. <laughs> I can. I, ju I just went along with this. Okay, let me just explain. <laughs> um, Chris doesn't drink milk. He has this special hippie milk that isn't milk. Lacto-free milk. Lacto-free milk. It, it still is milk. Mm. What, does it, what does it give you if you drink real milk? Well, bottom problems, I squits. think, is, is, <laughs> yes, is the easiest way of yes, putting it. I come in in the morning and, and I just, you know, I'm on autopilot and I make two coffees and a tea. And it's a very nice gesture, though. Thank you. So that when Jules and Chris show up, they've got a nice hot beverage waiting on our desk. Nice, which is very nice, nice thing to do. I I thought, but I forgot like weeks ago 
that Chris has this hippie milk, and and I didn't, and I'd forgot. You've been having genuine milk for the last few weeks. How have you been? My my wife's been complaining to me. <laughs> I mean, you should know. You're way. the one that has to share the gents' loo with him, surely. Actually, now you come to mention it. <laughs> and I, no, I'm serious. And it's and now, all your fault. Now you come to mention it. <laughs> It's that, because you go in, you pull the cord and the light and the fan comes on. I often, if I've been in after Chris, I go out, I don't pull the cord again, I leave that fan on. Yeah. <laughs> Graham Mack and Jules, and the Cannes Film Festival is coming. Ah, yes, all the glamour of the Cannes Film Festival. Now, I'm not talking about the one in France. At the same time that one is going on, the real Cannes Film Festival is happening here. Only we're going to have it with our own cans of sweet corn and cans of spam and cans of all sorts of goodness. It's your chance to see a film for free whilst helping the local food bank. So we're putting on a performance of The Love Punch, which is a brand new film starring Piers Brosnan and Emma Thompson. looks really funny. It's at the Garden City Cinema on Sunday, May the 18th, at the same time as the Cannes Film Festival in France. And you could be there for free. All you need to do is bring along a can of food per person. That goes to the local food bank and you see a film for free. Everyone's a winner. If you'd like to go, you've got to register, although it is free because we need to know about numbers and we'll need to know when it's sold out because it will sell out. We don't want to turn people away on the day. You can register now at our website. Check it out, actually. The trailer to the film is on there too. The film looks really funny. It's, it's kind of a romantic comedy, but also it's a bit of a caper as well. So you can check that out and register now, but be quick at bobfm.co.uk. Bob's Breakfast. Let's get the latest news now with Chris Hubbard. It's an interesting one in the news this morning about Cornish people. They're going to be granted minority status under European rules for the protection of national minorities. It means they'll gain the same status as other Celtic communities like the Scots, the Welsh, the Irish as well. Yeah, but what does that mean? To be well, granted <laughs> as a minority, what does it actually mean for them? A very good question, because the exact details aren't yet clear. They're saying that uh, all what, what this actually means on a day-to-day -day basis will become clear over the coming months and, and weeks, but it just means that things like the Cornish language uh, will be given extra protection, so um, sort of extra oomph to the oh, Cornish. Oh no, it's not going to become like Wales, is it, where everything's written in two languages and every sign is double the size. In March this year, uh, Nick Clegg announced the government would be investing £120,000. Um, this was to go into the Cornish Language Partnership to promote and develop the language. Nobody speaks it. It's pointless. If they've got a cultural identity, though, you don't want it to disappear. Well, no. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. putting money to, into a dead language it just seems a bit... does seem a bit pointless. I mean, what I heard this morning when I heard this story mm. is saying that you're not allowed to take the mick out of people from Cornwall anymore, which that's just no fun at all, is it? Pretty much. I mean, the, But do people yeah. do that? Do, I mean, I the Irish obviously had a real problem mm. with, with, you know, people telling racist jokes about Irish people. There's, there's an impression of Scots as well. Um, so, yeah. people I don't, do I don't, much, I do don't think I've heard these two Cornishmen, an Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman <laughs> and a Cornishman, <laughs> I don't think I've heard that joke. No. I think this is, as far as that's concerned, I think they're trying to fix a problem that doesn't really exist. Yeah. So this is what they were saying, they were saying uh, it'll be an end to jokes about the Cornish past. I've never heard any jokes <laughs> about the Cornish past. I can't, right, I'd it, like to hear one, there's a if chance. you know any if, jokes if, about if, Cornish past. Because, pasties. actually, you'll actually break, well, you're probably breaking some law now. Mm, let's, let's, mm. just for the sake of it, just for, for the point of demonstration, as, a, as scientific research, does anyone know a joke that's offensive towards Cornish people? Morning, Danny. What do you get if you put 22 Cornish women in a room? Don't know. A full set of teeth. Oh! Bob's Breakfast. Let's get the latest news now with Chris Hubbard. Plastic surgeons this morning saying they're concerned about the number of young people who are wanting 
bit of a nip and a tuck, maybe a boost here and there, and wanting these cosmetic procedures. There's a story in the news also this morning about a woman who's had uh, plastic surgery to get the perfect selfie as well. She, she's, what? 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 She, she's had longer arms. <laughs> <laughs> We want to hear more Cornish jokes. Well, Tony's Tony's not helping. He's just been in touch. What did he say? He says, Cornish is a dead language. Or as they say in Cornwall, Cornish is a dead language. I don't get it. Chris Hubbard has your news. The world's dirtiest man. Hmm. Ludwig Dolezal. Uh, he sleeps buried in a pile of hot ash. And he doesn't want to have a wash. Uh, he's, he's burnt his duvet in his mattress to keep a fire going at his home, which is an abandoned farmhouse in the Czech Republic. Um, <laughs> government officials are, are refusing to pay him benefits as they fear he's only going to burn his hand out. The world's dirtiest man. <laughs> if you don't count Max Clifford. Bob's Breakfast. Every morning we give you the chance to win tickets to Cineworld. All you have to do is guess what film we're acting out a scene from. I am Solomon Northup. I'm a free man, a resident of Saratoga, New York. You have no right whatsoever to detain me. What film is that? It's 12 Years a Slave. If you say 12 Years a Slave, you win. Okay, Pete, what film is it? Yeah, the film is Roots. The film is Roots? Did you say the film is 12 Years a Slave? No. I thought I heard you say 12 Years a Slave. <laughs> Do you think it could be 12 Years a Slave? Yeah, it could be. Mm. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, it's a terribly bad line. There's a lot of traffic on this line. Uh, I, mean, I better just, let me just see if I can clear this up. Let me just push some buttons here. See if I can get this just clear. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so Pete's on the phone. Pete, what film do you think it is? I think it's Root. <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. Graham Mack this morning and Chris Hubbard has your news. Do you remember we did a story a little bit back about prisons banning books? Yeah. Coming in. Well, now th this government policy uh, may face a legal challenge. The Ministry of Justice uh, is being told that uh, a female prisoner serving a life sentence has been left in despair by the ban. It's you know, to go through the whole if thing. you want to be able to read whatever books people send you, mm. Don't commit crime. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We're talking about terrible jobs this morning. There's a bloke in China. His job is being hit in the stomach. He charges people to hit him in the stomach. So what's the worst job you've ever had? I remember I had a Saturday job at Liverpool Airport in the Argyle restaurant. I was a kitchen porter. Which basically meant I loaded and unloaded the dishwashing machine, the big Hobart dishwashing machine. And I also had to scrape all the plates into this, what I thought was like a waste disposal thing, until the end of the shift on the first day I realised there was just a big plastic bin bag under there c collecting them and I had to drag the thing into the lift to take it down to the... Oh, just horrible. But the thing I found out, I read a book about the Beatles recently and it turned out that John Lennon used to do that job. He was a kitchen porter at Liverpool Airport and the airport, the new Liverpool Airport, not the one that me and John Lennon worked in, but the new Liverpool Airport is called John Lennon Airport. They've named the airport after him, which means the next airport they build in Liverpool, they're going to obviously name after me. Graham Mack and Chris Hubbard has your news. The Mets police officers are going to start wearing tiny cameras on their uniforms as part of plans to boost transparency. It's a great idea, unless they start putting the cameras on the police dogs. That's very true. Because Have you seen that clip in the news? What's that? Recently. It's a, a clip that's been posted on YouTube of a dog um, going through 
guy just lunging forward um, who'd, who'd been um, held for, I think, assaulting two police officers, and this dog just lurched forward. That wasn't my worry. It was no. the, the dog started licking itself. You know, <laughs> you, you don't, you don't want to see that on the video, do you? Talking about smells that take you back in time, there's a survey out today. It says that lavender and peppermint are the most likely to spark memories of your grandmother. Oh, yeah, do you know what, actually? Gran and I used to collect the lavender from outside the house and we used to make little lavender bags and we'd make them for our underwear drawer. She'd tell them to put them in with our knickers, these little lavender bags, and make them smell nice. And does the smell take you back and remind you of her? Yeah, it does, actually. Isn't that yeah. nice? So that you can you can go back in time whenever you like with the right. To see if I went. To, I mean, I love my grandmother, but the smell that takes me back is tobacco. Nice <laughs> tobacco, just that stale tobacco from the bottom of a shopping bag. Uh, yeah, well, she, you mean the loose stuff? She used to reach. She said, "Hey, I'll give you the sweezy," and she'd reach in the bottom of a shopping <laughs> bag and she'd find like a boiled sweet whenever you suck on it. The taste of tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Hubbard has the latest news. Well, a Chinese school teacher delighting his students by kissing a pig. Basically, what he what he intended to do with this is at the start of term said, "Look, if you don't drop litter, you won't get punished, but I'll kiss a pig at the end of term." But there's an incentive, an idea for Hertfordshire's uh, school teachers. Yeah, we could do Seems that. that some, the, uh... some friends of mine were were ahead of the game many, many years ago when we were in our twenties. You yeah. know, we used to go to a nightclub and we all used to have a sweep, <laughs> and one of the guys had to find the ugliest woman in the. We we didn't we called it grab a grot, but uh, it was the same result. So it looks like. <laughs> Although I that was wrong, we, that. we were <laughs> <laughs> way ahead of the game. <laughs> What smell takes you back in time, back to your childhood? Come back in time with me now, Sarah. What is the smell that takes you back? Creosote. Creosote. Oh, I love that smell, Sarah. I know, and you can't buy it anymore. Can't you? No, it's illegal, apparently. Why not? Is it dangerous or something? Something like that. Oh, that's a shame, because that smells so good. Yeah, it said carcinogenic. It does exactly what uh, it says on the tin. Right. <laughs> Get the latest news now with Chris Hubbard. Dog couples tying the knot at a mass canine wedding in Peru. Uh, this is something that they thought would be a good idea to promote responsible pet ownership. It, what, to have married pets? It just sounds a bit odd. Only one step pets. further, we're gonna, we're gonna end up with, we've got like doggy weddings now, we're eventually gonna get doggy divorce, aren't we? Yeah. So, it, so It's only a matter of so, time. So why did he, he divorce her? Well, she was a total bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Party disaster stories and awkward moments at parties. Dave. I was at a party where a very drunk friend told me he loved me. <laughs> and I thought it was just beer talk. Yeah. You know, very drunk. Mm. I love you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, oh great, I love you too. <laughs> to get him to shift, basically. Yeah, just to make him go right. away. Which I didn't realise he actually meant it. And I said we were going to tell our wives. <laughs> oh no! Because I, I think my wife knows. Oh. Uh, you've got kids and stuff. Oh. Uh, <laughs> like, Dave. Oh, the guy's really. Oh, that's a kind of, That's a sad story there, Dave. Yeah, da I was like, oh. no, I love you as a friend. <laughs> I don't, um. I don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not a touchy feely kind of blouse. <laughs> Awkward! Don't get station deflation. <laughs> Turn your knob to Bob. Chris Hubbard has your news. Somebody in Singapore felt a sharp pain in her thigh while she was on the loo, discovered a six-foot python had emerged from the toilet bowl and sunk its teeth into her leg. Oh. Uh, I mean, no. imagine that. You've just been, even if it doesn't attack you, and you look down and you see a snake, you're going to go, I can't remember eating that. <laughs> Talking about when you've appeared on screen. Helen. Oh, well, that was a couple of weeks ago on um, ITV's This Morning. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, the story got out um, about myself, because I've been married four times. 
and uh, I was meant to be interviewed about uh, my my business and my music that I get involved with called Folkstock. But when the researcher found out about my personal life, uh, they were much more interested in that. <laughs> that got picked up by the Daily Mail and Women's Own, and then Eamon and Ruth invited me in to uh, this morning. <laughs> What's the story? Well, what it was is that, on average, it seems to be that my marriages have lasted seven years. Ah. So it's true what they say about the seven-year itch? I, mean, I, don't, I don't think that as people approach seven years, they wonder whether it's going to work or not. But I do think that if you're in a relationship that you don't feel is going where you want it to go, and you've tried really hard to get it there, especially if you've got children, by seven years, you, you're either settled on the huge compromise you're going to have to make, probably. So you know or, one way or the other? Or you just think, I've got to look up for myself here, and I've got, and everyone will be happier if we hopefully amicably split. So that's actually what's happened. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> All the best to you, Helen, and your future ex-husband. Bob's Breakfast. Graham Mack and Chris Hubbard has your news. A guy called Alan Thompson wanted to thank Elizabeth Moulton by returning her 4x4 with a full tank after he borrowed it for the weekend, but he pumped petrol no. into this off-roader unaware no. it actually ran on diesel. Now, this, this car, it's not cheap. It costs 50 grand, so obviously any repairs are going to be quite pricey as well. Uh, she noticed it had a problem uh, when the car started spluttering. Uh, she took it to the local dealership. Um, the dealership's quoted her 14 and a half grand. They have an expensive mistake. It really is. It's, yeah. It, the thing is, if you do it, and I've done it. Have you? Have it you? was a work car as oh, well. No. Oh, but no. I realised I'd done it. I, I put petrol in a diesel mm. and i realized i'd done it so didn't start it and that's the key if you don't oh, start it? them well then, if, then the you you just you, i rang up i said look i feel like I'm such an idiot i've just realized i've put petrol in the diesel mm -hmm. and they drain them and it's like a couple of hundred quid and y you're fine but if you start them then it's big money yeah because oh, wow. it goes through the engine and it's not good but it's madness why is the nozzle the same size how hard would it be to create a nozzle like, you could have, like, a round nozzle for petrol and a triangular nozzle for diesel. How hard would it be Well, you could just look at, the, you know, the type of fuel that should go in it. I know, <laughs> but, you know, I know a guy who, as it turned out, had a brain tumour at the time and did the same mm -hmm. thing. And it was because he, we didn't realise, he, di he did it. Sandy, he died in the end, but Sandy did it. And we thought, well, Isn't that's... not a great story? <laughs> no, but we thought, well, that's not like Sandy. He's been driving these cars, these work cars. It was when I was at the BBC. He's, he's been working, doing this, putting, going out on the road for like 20 years at this radio station for him to suddenly do it that's just a bit odd yeah and then months later he's diagnosed with a brain tumor but people people i mean he had a medical condition but i other... just realized who you're talking about this is sandy martin yeah yeah, yeah he did goodness. it yeah swim the marathon the the uh, what well, yeah and uh it, that it all came back to that mm. but people you know you can be having a bad day you can be having a stressful day your mind can be on something else and it's if it's not your car mm. you know if it's a work car or if someone's loaned you a car it can happen. So why not change the nozzle so it just can't happen? I mean, the petrol station, if you want to use the toilet, they'll give you a key on a big stick so you can't <laughs> put it in your pocket. But they won't have a nozzle that stops you putting the wrong fuel in. Our contestant this morning to play Jokasaurus is Tia. How are you, Tia? Oh, I'm good. You're good? Now, where are you from? I'm um, Stevenage. From Stevenage, okay. And how old are you? Ten. Ten. Where'd you go to school? The best school in Nebworth. <laughs> the best school in Nebworth. Is that what? It, what's it called? Nebworth School. Just called Nebworth School. Okay, and it's the mm -hmm. best school. It's actually not far from Nebworth House, then, isn't it? Mm. Nebworth House is, I mean, they've got all sorts there. You know they've got 72 life-size dinosaurs there, prehistoric creatures grazing through the shrubbery? Whoa. It's Yeah, it's like going back in time. Now, to win a family pass to you, uh, you have to tell me a great dinosaur joke. It's Jokosaurus. So what have you got for me? Why can't you hear a pterodactyl using the bathroom? Why can't you hear a pterodactyl using the bathroom? I don't know. Because the pee is silent. <laughs> 
That's a brilliant joke. You're going to know what <laughs> Bob's Breakfast. It's Graham Mack and Chris Hubbard has your news. There's been so much in the news this week about obesity. Now, another story linking light bedrooms to obesity. So, uh, if you sleep in a room with too much light in it, a team at the Institute of Cancer Research in London found women had larger waistlines if their bedroom was light enough to see across at night. Light it's is making you fat now. Light is making you fat Is it now. because of the lack of sleep or something? It is, yeah. Well, Sleep's massively important, isn't it? Oh, completely. Don't you don't you know it? When but I've gonna... said this before. I don't get windows. I don't like them. Uh, and look look what they're doing now. They're making us all obese. They're giving us uh, heart disease and all the obesity-related problems, all caused by windows. What is the point of windows? If you want to look outside, go outside. What, what's the point? <laughs> they're, they're, you know, if you insulate your house, you'll find that all the heat's escaping through. The, when you touch the window, it's cold in the winter. They're not, they're, they're not insulated properly. You need to double glaze them. Why do you double glaze them? To make them a bit more like a wall. Lateral light is what? good for you, though. But it's going, it's, it's all the UVs being filtered out by the glass. You're not even getting that. If you want to be outside, go outside. I, I don't, I don't understand windows. I really don't get it. Artificial light is fabulous. There's something wonderful about exploring the great indoors. As long as it's nice and light and it's not dark, not too dark. But if you want it dark, at the flick of a switch, it's dark. But if there's a window in there, it'll mess that all up. And it'll make you fat. Bob's Breakfast.